but welcome. Um, we're so glad you could join us for the second Department of Correction DOC Insider Series uh, webinar topics. Our topic today is going to be um, intake to classification. Jessica, if you could move to slide two. And then um, slide three. My name is Heather Zwicker and I'm the Deputy Chief of uh, planning, research, and reentry within the Office of the Commissioner at the Department of Correction, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our presenters today will be Joanna Champney and Heidi Collier. Joanna is the Chief of Planning, Research, and Reentry at the Department of Correction. Planning, Research, and Reentry is a specialized unit within the Office of the Commissioner that leads the DOC's uh, data collection and analysis efforts. We facilitate strategic planning. We oversee the Department's accreditation and compliance. Um, and provide project management for multi-bureau initiatives. We're also tasked with expanding and improving prisoner reentry initiatives within the department. Chief Champney served as a commission member of the Delaware Correctional Reentry Commission and is currently chairing the commission's transition team. Prior to coming to the Department of Correction, Joanna served as the executive director of the Delaware Center for Justice. While at DCJ, she oversaw a combination of direct service programs and policy reform initiatives. Joanna also um, worked uh, to uh, repeal mandatory minimum drug laws in Delaware as the executive director of Stand Up for What's Right and Just. Joanna earned her master's degree in criminology from the University of Pennsylvania and um, a degree in political science from the University of Delaware where she was named a woman of promise. Joanna has served the board of directors on the Delaware Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the continuum of care which administers federal HUD funds. And we are very lucky to have Joanna here at the Department of Correction. Heidi Collier is the Director of Classification and Special Programs for DOC. She has been with the department for 16 years. Heidi began her career as a correctional officer at the James T. Vaughan Correctional Center. She went on to uh, become a probation and parole officer and rose to the rank of PMP supervisor before returning to the Bureau of Prisons in 2018 to serve as the Director of Classification and Special Programs. Director Collier's office directs and manages the operation of the inmate classification system, statewide transfers between facilities, and interstate prison transfers um, with other states. Heidi was named the 2020 Delaware um, Department Correction Employee of the Year. Thank you, Joanna and Heidi, for presenting for us today. And Joanna or Jessica, can we have slide four? So today's agenda is going to include an overview of the department structure. We're going to discuss prison intake, inmate assessments, and the classification process. We're going to talk about how the department assesses risks and needs of each inmate to guide decision making related to things such as housing, programming, treatment, uh, work assignments, things of that nature in order to promote rehabilitation and successful reentry. Chief Tampany and Director Collier will walk you through an inmate's experience from intake to one of our facilities through the classification process. We're also going to give you some information about ways to get involved and connected. And at the end, we will have a period of q and i I'd ask that you submit um, your questions through the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you can submit your questions through Q&A versus um, the chat screen, it's actually it's easier to keep track of your, your questions that way. Um, we'll select some questions at the end um, and pose those questions to Joanna and Heidi at the end of the webinar. Um, due to the large number of attendees, I think we have 135 people registered, which is wonderful. Uh, we might not be able to get to all of the questions, but we will um, attempt to, you know, get to as many questions as possible. And then unanswered questions, we'll attempt to respond um, through email after the webinar. Um, some housekeeping items. Um, all attendees are muted. Um, only the um, panelists and moderator um, have microphone options today. The webinar is going to be recorded and we will make the recording and PowerPoint available um, after the webinar is completed. We'll also supply certificates of attendance for those who stay tuned in um, for the entire webinar. So we can get that out to everyone after the webinar is completed. We're also going to conduct some polls during the webinar to try to keep things interactive. Um, your responses are anonymous. Um, um, and uh, we did polls last time and I think it, it worked really well and, and allowed us to, to get some information and keep everyone involved. So for our first, first poll question, we're gonna, um, we'd like to get a sense of who's joining us. So we invite you to check in um, and let us know um, how you might fit into um, what stakeholder group best describes you here. So the poll should be up on your screen. 
Um, we'll give you a minute to respond um, and then we'll be able to see the results. So we have a lot of responses coming in already. A lot of DOC employees here today, a lot of other, um, other state agency employees, non-DOC, nonprofit employees and volunteers. Give it another couple of seconds. We have about 80 responses. Right. Almost everyone who's on has has responded. All right, so I'll go ahead and end the poll and share the results with you. So 40% of our attendees today are DOC employees, um, followed by uh, state agency employees, non DOC, nonprofit employees or volunteers. Um, community members and advocates and, and, and then other. So that's great that we have um, a broad range of people who are here with us to you know, gain some more information and knowledge on the department's um, inmate classification system. So now, um, Jessica, if you can go on to the next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Heidi and she's gonna share some information with you um, about the department's structure. Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Heather, and thank you for the invitation to speak on behalf of DOC's classification process. And everyone that's online, it's really amazing to have a large group together and be able to kind of talk this out and give you guys some folks on what's happening behind the scenes with DOC. Uh, my goal today is just to provide a generalized overview of what happens once someone actually enters our system and to give folks a clear picture of the important work that's being done to ensure that those are those in our custody are being placed in appropriate programs, education, employment, pro-social activities, while maintaining the safety and the security of our prison. So if you could go to the next slide, please. All right. One of the things I always like to kick us off with is to discuss um, the structure of the Department of Corrections in reference to the five levels of supervision that was established under, under the Delaware Sentencing Accountability Commission. Um, today's focus will be on level five, our 24 hour incarceration. But please be mindful, we have four other levels, which include our level four work release facilities, our home confinement units, residential drug treatment. We have a violation probation center under the level four under level three, level two, and level one is our community corrections or our probation offices, which offer intensive supervision, field or standard probation, and administrative probation as well. Um, please note one thing that I like to add on this slide is at the bottom corner on the right, uh, there's a source noted for the CJC SENTAC guidebook, which is basically a sentencing guideline that allows that gives us the authority to have our syntax levels and it provides us with information to work with our folks that are in our custody to understand the different sentencing guidelines. A lot of good information is available to you in that resource if you want to kind of expand your, your knowledge of the inner workings of the DOC and how some things operate. Again, I would encourage you to check that out. And if you could go to the next slide, please. All right. So just a quick little layout of our level five and our level four facilities. We have Howard R. Young located up in the city of Wilmington. We have BWCI, which is our female facility located up in Newcastle. James D. Vaughn located in Smyrna, SCI at Georgetown. That's our level five population. And as of this morning, Howard R. Young, we are sitting on a population of 1,089. James T. Vaughn came in at 1737, Baylor at 194, and SCI. Oh, the wrong number for SCI. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I have to rerun the numbers for SCI for this morning. But in level four, we have Plummer Community Correction Centers that's located in Wilmington, Hazel Deep Plant, which is a work release treatment center located right on the same grounds as BWCI, as well as CCTC or the Community Corrections Treatment Center, which 
came off ground was late last year, about November, October, November last year. It was the old, uh, what we used to call SEVA, which is now our treatment only facility for the state at level four. And then lastly, Sussex Community Correction Center located in Georgetown, which is also home to our violation probation center. CCTC is running at 69 participants in the R2R program or Road to Recovery. HDP is looking at 26, Plumber is at 96, and SCCC or Sussex Community Correction Center, we are looking at 113 residents at the facility today. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, another very important under factor that we have to consider when we're looking at our classification and our intake system is Delaware operates as a unified correction system, meaning our jail, our prison, and our pre-trial -popul pre population are all housed in our four prison systems. Delaware is one of six states that unify populations. Some of the other states include Alaska, Connecticut, Hawaii, Vermont, Rhode Island, and kind of as defined in the slide for you, our detention population is that it's those that are not sentenced to a period of incarceration. Delaware defines our jail population as those with less than one year and those that are sentenced to one year or more are considered our prison population. Just to kind of give you an example from today's count, Howard R. Young came in at 1089. 618 or approximately 57% of the cases are detentioners. We had 44 jail terms or, or about 4% of the population and we have 427 serving prison terms or about 39% of the population. And I bring this up because being a unified system from a case planning perspective, correctional staff have to be able to determine the needs of each person entering the system based upon that sentencing, which kind of brings us to our next slide. Okay, good morning, everyone. Joanna Champney here. Um, as Heather said, I'm the Chief of Planning, Research, and Reentry in the Office of the Commissioner. Um, in a moment, I'm going to talk about the kinds of assessments that occur at intake when inmates uh, first become incarcerated. But first, I wanted to just provide a little bit of context uh, for the guiding principles of the assessment activities. Um, DOC is required by policy to adhere to evidence-based practices and corrections. These are commonly referred to as core correctional practices. Um, and if you're not familiar with core correctional practices or um, CCP for short, they really emerged in the 1980s based on research, um, essentially documenting what approaches and methods are effective in changing behavior of incarcerated and supervised people. Um, and research has consistently shown that programs that contained elements of these core correctional practices were associated with greater reductions in recidivism compared to those that did not. Um, currently in Delaware, about one in five people who leave prison after serving one or more years return within three years to serve another year or more of prison. And so the more we can integrate core correctional practices, um, the lower we hope to get that return to prison rate. And so for this reason, DOC attempts to include these approaches um, in as many of our operational decisions as possible. The first three core correctional practices that are shown here are important for today's discussion. The first practice is assess risk and needs. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. The idea here is that without an empirical assessment of the risk factors and needs that someone has, it would be very difficult to match inmates to appropriate programming or to help them with case planning. Um, some risk factors in a person's life are more predictive of causing return to prison than others, and a good risk assessment will help identify which issues to prioritize. And so we're going to talk about that extensively later. And the second principle here is enhance motivation to change. This is important because people who are being forced to participate in treatment, like in prison, need to decide that they want to change in order for the course material to stick. Staff in some of our programs have been trained on how to use certain approaches to get participants to start thinking about wanting to change. And if you're interested in that, you can do some research on the stages of change theory and some of the techniques that program staff can use to increase motivation um, uh, to change within their clients. 
the, the third principle here is target interventions, and that refers to matching the right people to the right programs in the prison. This goes back to that first principle of assessing each prisoner's risk factors and needs. Um, and once we know what the inmate's greatest needs and risk factors are, we match them to programming that can address it. It really wouldn't make much sense to send someone to, let's say, a substance use disorder treatment program if they've never used illegal substances or if it doesn't impact their daily life in any way. And so we'll cover later how DOC does that treatment matching. Next slide. So we now turn to walking you through the intake process, essentially what happens when people enter the prison. Next slide. We're going to follow a fictional person, Johnny Smith, to illustrate the assessment to classification process. Um, so let's talk about what's happening with Johnny. Johnny Smith was dropped off at a at Sussex Correctional Institution by state police. Um, he's being charged with robbery in the first degree with possession of a firearm. He was on probation at the, at the time of the alleged robbery and his bail is currently set at $50,000. Um, Johnny's case is considered a violent felony. Um, robbery is the lead charge, um, is about 10% of our prison population and violent lead charges make up about 43% of our prison population. Next slide. So after being booked into the facility, um, Johnny sees a nurse who works for our contracted medical and behavioral health provider. They're called Centurion. This visit happens within the first four hours that he's in custody. Um, and as part of the medical assessment, which is screening him for any medical conditions that need immediate attention, the nurses are gonna be checking the Delaware Health Information Network or DIN um, to verify any prescriptions that Johnny is on and also to verify any important medical information. Um, that screening is also going to include a risk of suicide assessment. Uh, we happen to use a tool called the SBQR for any of you clinical folks um, and a screening for mental health disorders. We use a tool called the MHSF3. Um, that's going to identify any of the major diagnostic clusters of mental health disorders. Um, we also screen for substance use disorder and we use a tool for that called the TCU Drug Screen 5. Inmates also take an oral swab that screens for illegal substances that are in their system, and they may also be subject to a breathalyzer test. Um, people who screen positive for opiates or alcohol who would need to detox safely are placed on special protocol to do that. Um, and also inmates who identify as transgender are identified during this time during those initial screenings. So if the patient's assessment determines that there is some type of mental health or substance use disorder, further evaluation is gonna be required um, and they are referred for a full, full comprehensive exam at that time. The full comprehensive exam that comes from that initial referral typically will happen within seven days. If it is elevated as urgent, then it happens much sooner. Um, the comprehensive exam, which uh, is gonna re result in a diagnosis being issued um, is entered into the Department of Corrections electronic health record called iChart. And within the last couple of years, DOC has actually created some categories in our data system to be able to quickly count how many inmates have mental health disorders, substance use disorders, or both, which are referred to as co-occurring disorders. And that helps us to answer questions from the public um, about some of the conditions among our population. Um, and I do want to mention that DOC is now offering medication-assisted treatment um, to people with opiate use disorder. Um, so medication-assisted treatment, if you're not familiar with what that is, is the use of medications in combination with counseling and behavior therapies um, to provide a whole patient approach to the treatment of substance use disorders. Um, and all the medications used as part of MAT are approved by the FDA. And currently at DOC, the pharmaceuticals that we have been approved to use in our prisons are methadone, Suboxone, Vivitrol, and Subutex. Um, we're going to be covering healthcare in the prisons on a later webinar in our DOC Insider Series. Um, and we will also have a separate session in August about substance use disorder treatment and medication assisted treatment in prison. So if this is a particular topic that interests you, um, we invite you to please tune in for that. You're going to be receiving information via email when both of those upcoming sessions have been scheduled. Next slide. Um, and so today's information isn't intended to cover everything that happens during prison intake because a lot of things are happening. Uh, but we did want to mention a few of those things that Johnny would also be doing during his first few days incarcerated to just provide you with that context. Um, of course, booking and receiving comes first um, and his property and personal belongings would be inventoried. 
DOC staff um, would be assessing Johnny for risk of being sexually victimized while he's in prison, as well as his risk for victimizing another inmate. And that assessment is called the PREA assessment and refers to the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, the results of that screening would impact Johnny's housing assignment because we wouldn't want to house a potential aggressor and a potential victim in the same cell. Um, and Johnny is also going to be issued his standard issued DOC belongings, which includes his DOC issued clothing, hygiene items, his inmate ID card, his linens. Um, and then once his inmate account is set up, Johnny will have the opportunity to make purchases from the commissary at the prison. But until then, he will have his prison issued items. Um, we already talked about the medical assessment and screening that are done by Centurion. And then um, Johnny is also going to receive his housing assignment, which may change um, after his case is further reviewed. His inmate account is set up, which is necessary for him to make purchases from the commissary, to make phone calls and use the tablets. Um, and then for inmates who are found to be indigent, um, there are mechanisms in place um, for individuals without those resources to make calls. Um, inmates are, are also going to be submitting their phone list when they come into the prison um, with a list of people that they're requesting to call while they're incarcerated. And that list would be reviewed within a few days to a week um, for approval. And then inmates are also receiving an orientation to the prison, which typically includes an inmate handbook. Next slide. All right, so now we're going to begin to discuss the classification process. And when we talk about the classification process, kind of think of it like the motor of the facility that navigates each and every inmate to their destination through their incarceration based upon several factors, including their behavior, their history, rehabilitative needs, the assessment that Chief Chantney had just spoke about. All of these different things have to play into every single person's case that's coming into our facility. You know, objective classification systems, it's one of the most important tools that we use inside of our classification, inside of the classification process for our facilities, because it looks at escape information, it looks at safety information. And if you consider the DOC mission statement, we are to provide safe and humane facilities for all inmates and staff. And this is where the hub or the motor kind of starts from the intake through the classification. May I have the next slide, please? All right, so after about six months, Johnny is convicted and he's actually sentenced to two years at level five prison. Kind of like we spoke about earlier, since he's serving a two year sentence, he will be considered part of our prison population. So upon sentencing, the court will then notify and provide sentencing information to our central offender records. And there's a little note down here. We will have a, another docu-series in the future to talk about what sentence calculation release dates look like in the Delaware DOC. So once central records upstate, updates the information, they will alert the treatment staff to actually begin the process of classification. Go ahead to the next slide, please. All right. So how do we decide on Johnny's path forward? There are several different assessments that's going to take place with Johnny over the next, say, usually we try to do it within 45 days of sentencing. First assessment, we will look at his initial risk assessment. Second assessment, we're going to take a look at his level service inventory revised, or also known as the LSIR. And then the third assessment we're going to take into consideration is his risk needs and responsivity. These three assessments will work together to help us create a treatment plan for Johnny during the course of his incarceration. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. All right. All right, so like I just mentioned, security risk assessment, LSIR, R&R, and of course the classification board and review and decision. That's gonna be an important piece to all of this. I know we get a lot of questions, at least my office gets a lot of questions on reference to the classification boards and how these decisions are derived from our assessment process. So it's very important that we will kind of discuss in detail each of the assessments. I will go through the initial and then Chief Chantney will talk to you about the LSIR and the R&R information that is going to be 
kind of packaged together for Johnny over the course of his incarceration. Okay, the next slide, please. All right. The first thing we need to take a look at is that security risk assessment. Here we are look, we're using that objective based point system to determine if the person is maximum, medium, or minimum security housing. This is very important, of course, to folks that are working on the inside of the facility because this is what's truly going to help us maintain our safety. We want to make sure that if we have someone that may be problematic or may have staff assaults, we are supervising them appropriately to the level of their security risk. Classification risk assessments we conduct regularly on a schedule. Zero to five years will be done for every six months, five years or longer prison terms, they will be done every 12 months. And then life sentences, again, will be done once every 12 months. And this is going to be important for you to remember later on in our series. We will revisit some of this toward the end of the uh, discussion. But some of the other information I want to share with you in reference to the security risk assessment, like I mentioned, it is a point based system. Built into the security risk assessment, there are override factors that the Delaware Department of Correction classification team do have an option to review, such as if there's an override factor for, say, a staff assault that requires. Policy requires Delaware staff to actually move that person up due to that staff assault for a minimum of two years. There are discretionary overrides that come into play with the objective point system. Some of the discretionary may be to decrease a level of supervision for, say, someone's reentry period. You know, Johnny Smith, we'll just use him as an example, is on, say, his last six months of his incarceration. He's been doing fairly well, but he's scoring just above, you know, the minimum to the medium security classification. There is discretion with staff to allow him to actually come down to a minimum status so he can be open to more opportunities and privileges in a medium status classification setting. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that Heidi has covered the security risk assessment, I'm going to talk about the two remaining assessments that occur before an inmate's initial classification. Uh, both of these are completed by DOC correctional counselors who work in the prisons. Uh, the first assessment is the LSIR, and the second assessment is the Assess an Individual Tool from George Mason University. Um, we call that one the r and &R tool for short. I'm going to talk about each of those assessments separately in just a minute, explaining what they do. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the, the scientific principles of these tools. Next slide. So both the LSIR and the r, &R tools are based on the risk and need principle. Jess, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the risk principle refers to risk for committing another offense after they are released from prison, unlike what Heidi just covered, which is really more focused on someone's uh, risk for committing some type of offense in the prison to determine their security level in the prison. These assessments that I'm talking about are really more about predicting reoffending post release from prison. Um, and so the way that the LSIR and the r, &R tools assess an inmate's risk for committing future offenses after prison is by looking at both static risk factors and their dynamic risk factors. So what does that mean? Static factors are those that typically do not change, such as the person's birth year, the age at which they were first arrested, whether they're male or female, et cetera. Um, certain static factors are highly predictive of someone's likelihood to commit additional offenses. Dynamic factors, on the other hand, include those things that can change, like, for example, someone's employment status or their social relationships, um, their housing situation. And certain dynamic factors have also been found to be highly predictive of whether someone will commit more offenses. Um, the need principle is a second basic component of these assessment tools. And the research has found that the more unmet needs that people have, especially certain unmet needs that we call criminogenic needs, um, that's going to have a major impact on whether they will commit future offenses in the community. Um, the criminogenic needs that are most predictive of reoffending are if the person has peers who are antisocial, if the person has an antisocial personality, whether the person has antisocial thinking, 
and whether the person has antisocial behavior. And so risk assessment tools are assessing for, for that combination of static and dynamic risk factors, as well as their needs. And that's gonna establish an inmate's risk level. And you may be wondering, well, why would we need to know how likely someone is to commit a future offense if they're already in prison now? Like, why are we assessing risk levels or likelihood to return to the system? They're here now, why does it matter? Well, the reason is that we understand not all incarcerated people are actually at high risk for becoming reincarcerated. And we know that some inmates are at very high risk for becoming reincarcerated. And so the best way um, that we prioritize people for programming spots and decide which programming is right for them is to base that partially on their risk level. Next slide. So after we assess people's risk factors and needs, we are then very focused on matching them to the right programs in the prison. And this is a component of what we call the responsivity principle. So the R&R tool um, that we utilize makes program recommendations for each inmate and that's customized for each individual inmate. The tool helps us to match that person's risk factors and needs with which programs, um, but also how much programming is appropriate. And so programs need to have the right amount of dosage or number of hours to match someone's um, risk level. For example, if someone is low risk and low need, we wouldn't want to put them in a high dosage program because it could actually have negative effects to do so. Next slide. So the tools that DOC uses to assess risk factors and needs help us prioritize which ones pose the greatest barriers for someone's success. Um, think of barriers like criminal history, employment and educational deficits, family or marital problems, lack of involvement in pro-social activities, alcohol and drug problems, um, pro-crime attitudes, antisocial personality. If you think of all those as bricks in a wall that stand between someone and their stability, our assessment tools are helping to identify which parts of the wall are built up the highest. And if they are dynamic factors that can be changed with programming, and if so, we target those. Next slide. So the level of service inventory revised or LSIR for short is a tool that we use. Um, it's used very widely across prison and probation departments across the country. Um, it's a tool that consists of 54 questions um, across the following domains. It asks about criminal behavior, drugs and alcohol, financial status, family and marital relationships, education and employment, leisure and recreation, emotional situation and personal views, companions and accommodations, and that re refers to housing, as well as attitudes and orientations. Typically, it takes about 45 minutes to complete an LSIR interview. And in the prisons, again, this is completed by our correctional counselors. And like Heidi said, it occurs within the first 45 days from the date of the inmate's sentencing. Any prisoner who is serving a sentence of six months or more who has at least six months of level five prison time remaining is evaluated with the LSIR. Um, and today's webinar is focused on assessments that happen in the prison, but I did wanna mention that we also use the LSIR in our level four or community correction centers, as well as with um, probation and parole. After the LSIR is completed, the tool scores the answers and it provides scores for each of those domains that you see in the table. Um, and it also provides an overall risk score that places someone in one of three risk level categories, low risk, moderate risk, or high risk to reoffend. And again, this is referring to risk for reoffending after prison. So now we're gonna do a little poll. We have a poll here. Can you go back to the previous slide, Jess? So poll number two, which you should see pop up on your screen right now, um, Chief Champney just discussed um, the LSIR and how it measures risk of reoffense. Um, the LSIR places inmates into one of three risk categories, low, moderate, and high risk to offend. Which category do you think most Delaware inmates would fall into? Lots of votes coming in. Thank you for participating. Give it a little bit more time.
Okay. So 79% um, of people attending today voted that they believe that most Delaware inmates fall into the moderate risk category, followed by 14% at high risk and 7% at low risk. Joanna, can you discuss how those results, these results compare to what we find in our facilities? Yes, um, and Jessica, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we will show you a visual breakdown um, of how our level five population scored on the LSIR. So I'm actually surprised that most of you said moderate risk and the majority of our prisoners are considered high risk um, at 51%, um, but we do have a, a pretty high number who are scoring moderate at 40. So, and also, you know, something to consider is that some people are right on that bubble of being on the high end of moderate, but right below high risk. Um, so we do see a large population kind of hanging out there right on the cusp between moderate and high. Um, so thank you for, for your guesses. Um, but yeah, 51% are considered high risk. Next slide, please. So next, um, let's talk about the r, &R tool that DOC uses. Um, this is an instrument that was developed by George Mason University, and it was adopted by Delaware DOC after the Justice Reinvestment Initiative came to the state. Um, and it's a 24 question assessment that helps to further assess individuals' risks and needs. What's different about this tool is that it doesn't simply identify the risk and need factors and whether people are low, moderate, or high risk to reoffend, but it also makes recommendations for which needs should be prioritized for treatment in the prison. And so each person who is assessed receives three programming type recommendations customized in order of priority for them. And DOC categorizes our programs into six different categories and they're shown here on the screen for you. Group A is programs that target severe substance use disorders. And that would be programs like our Road to Recovery Drug Treatment Program, Track 1, and that's gonna target hard drug users, it's a very high dosage program. Group B is programs that target criminal thinking and cognitive restructuring. That's gonna include programs like Think Things Through and Thinking for a Change, which some of you may have heard of. Group C is self-improvement and management, which would include the Road to Recovery Drug Treatment Program, Tracks 2 and 3. And that's a lower dosage drug treatment program um, compared to the one that I mentioned in Group A. Group D is social and interpersonal skills, and that could include programs like parenting and soft skills, communication classes. Group E is life skills, and that is gonna refer to education and employment. So vocational training and GED programs would fall into that category. And then group F is supervision only, which would be used for people who have very few risk factors and needs. Um, this category is very rarely used for incarcerated individuals. Next slide. Okay, so we talked just shortly about the program categories, but I wanted to mention a few other types of correctional programs that we offer in our prisons. Um, I know that there's a lot of people interested in the programs in our prisons. So for education, we offer a high school diploma program and GED certification in partnership with our Delaware Department of Education. Um, they provide adult prison education services in all of our level five prisons. Uh, we also offer some college courses, including a partnership with Dell Tech that we'll be launching in August for an associate's degree. Um, and there's a variety of vocational and technical training available as well. That includes programs like masonry and culinary training and welding. Inmates can also be classified to employment while they're incarcerated, and that can include institutional jobs like kitchen or maintenance worker. Um, and then we also have other correctional programs in addition to the few that I mentioned already, substance use disorder treatment, cognitive behavioral treatment. Um, we have restorative justice programming, financial skills, alternatives to violence, anger management, parenting. And then some inmates due to their commission of a driving under the influence offense or a sex offense uh, must also complete sex offender treatment or DUI treatment programs. Next slide. All right, so programs and activities. So programs aid in like the daily function, such as financial management, some life skills, education, but we also offer a lot of activities inside of our facilities that just keep folks busy and pro-social activities like we want to. If they're less structured, um, there are benefits. There's no, no negative consequences for not participating. And 
for activities, you know, the folks that come into the R&R &R category with like group F supervision only, we like to still keep them busy, whether they're in employment or if there's an activity available to them just to help them with basic life functionality and keeping them busy. Much like we have in the community with our, you know, our families and we stay busy doing different activities. We like to offer different activities and a broadband of different activities to those that are in our custody. I know from time to time, DOC puts out bids for paid contracts to offer some programming programs to our prisoners and our probation. I know that there should be a link, yep, at the very bottom to visit DOC reentry to uh, look for any bids currently uh, in, in place for programs and activities within our facilities. Next slide, please. All right, so back to Mr. Johnny Smith. So he met, he met with his correctional counselor. Um, we go through an interview process, discuss his life skills, what his needs look like, all of his previous records, and uh, Ms. Green recommends Johnny for programs based off the r, r assessment that was conducted during his classification process. All of the recommendations are then forwarded to the classification boards for the initial review. Next slide. Some of the strengths Johnny found, or the case manager found for Johnny was, you know, he has family, uh, does not have, does not support crime, physically healthy, he was work, he grew up working on his farm. Some of his needs that were identified, you know, some financial difficulties, mental health, internal associates, and then he had some education problems growing up. Next slide, please. All that information is going to be captured and forwarded to the classification boards. I'm going to spend a little bit of time with you talking about the various classification boards and the different layers of review that happens at the facility level and at the administration level. So we'll start with the MDT, which is the multidisciplinary board. That is where the classification will start. It's with the counselor, it's with a member of security, and the inmate is involved at this level. They had that sit down and interview, made some good recommendations, worked on their treatment plan. Those decisions are captured and it is brought to the MDT board for a vote. MDT will vote on all programs, education, security levels, activities. Those results will then forward to the Institutional Based Classification Board, which is known as the IBCC. And the IBCC at each level five facility is basically the supervisory level of the correctional counselor. So the supervisor, Counselor supervisor will review the work of the counselor. There will also be members of security and classification to review the totality of the initial recommendations for Johnny. Um, it gives it another set of eyes to take a look at the assessments, the security risk, and determine whether or not they approve or choose to decline the recommendations of the counselor. Those recommendations are finalized for initial classifications at the Central Classification Board, which is the CICB, that is located here in Dover. The CICB consists of all of the level five facilities coming together to reviewing the totality of the case. And this gives outside perspectives, and it also introduces our members from our SOG team, Special Operations Group, and our Intelligence Group, to look at any transfers between facilities, especially if we have any gang activity going on, or if there's history of STG participation, so on and so forth. So we can gather all of the information at one table to make the final recommendation on Johnny's classification. One additional, to actually two additional levels. So Johnny's classification will stop at CICD since his is initial, but bringing this forward and just for information purposes, we do offer and we do have a prior board, which is known as the Institutional Release Classification Board. So Johnny is not being considered for outside status placement, so he will not see the Institutional Release Classification Board. But the IRCB is the highest board at the Delaware DOC. 
the institutional release is three members of the public, myself, deputy wardens from the facilities and leadership from treatment leadership from the facilities. This board reviews only cases being considered for off ground status of a level five facility, community corrections placement while at level five. We also review any cases for interstate prison transfers. And this is the board that reviews your parole applications. All of the votes are recorded and then forwarded to the bureau chief for a final checkbox approval. So Delaware DOC, these are our four various classification boards that from start to finish, majority of our classifications will, initial classifications will go through MDT, IBCC and CICB. Reclassification will typically go from MDT just to IBCC moving forward. Head to the next slide, please. All right, so Johnny Smith. Johnny's classification was approved. He begins participating in work and programs like they scheduled. And then we will work on his next classification. And for Johnny, his next classification, since he is a two year, he's sentenced to two years, he will again, like we mentioned earlier, he will be reviewed in a few months. And I know we have another poll question coming up. I'm not sure if it was this slide or not. Or is it the next slide? No, it's not the next slide. Okay, I know we have another poll question coming up, so I don't want to ruin it. You can talk about the next poll question, but a couple things that we wanted to just we can like, poll question now if you're ready. Are you ready for it? All right, let's go ahead and do it, and then I'll wrap it up. Okay, so I think Director Collier was just talking about um, classification for. Um, Johnny Smith, our case study. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question to pose to you that I believe should pop up on your screen now. And it's how often would Johnny Smith, who has a two year level five prison sentence be reclassified according to DOC's classification policy? All right, we'll just give it another few seconds. Thank you for voting. We have a lot of votes coming in. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap up the poll. And the results that we received, we have 82% of participants believe that Johnny Smith will be classified, reclassified every six months, um, given that he has a two year sentence um, with us. Director Collier, can you talk about if that's correct? So yeah, majority of you are correct. Since he's sentenced to less than five years, he will be reviewed at six month intervals. And again, anyone sentenced to five years or longer will be reviewed at one year interval, intervals. So yeah, that's great. So I'm going to get this wrapped up. Uh, a couple of last closing thoughts. You know, I just want to kind of bring to your folks' attention, especially we have a lot of DOC staff online today. Over the past four years, you know, Delaware DOC, we've been evaluating our processes and practices as it's relating to our assessments and our decision making for individuals. You know, we are looking at adopting those best practices for that unified system to ensure that staff are making appropriate recommendations that impact rehabilitation and community service. One of the things I always love to talk about is, you know, the fact that more than 85% of our sentence population will be returning to our communities. They'll be our neighbors. They'll be your, they'll be your neighbor's family, your friends. And the use of our evidence-based assessments, you know, DOC staff are now empowered to make objective recommendations based on the assessments and the outcome versus those subjective recommendations. I know for decades, just working in the various roles that I've served in, you know, there has been a lot of folks that, you know, we used to go to the stand and just recommend programs because they were available. That was all that we had available. Or we'd be working off of court orders and the court would order Delaware DOC to um, have someone participate in a program and may not be conducive to their true rehabilitation pathway. You know, planning myself and a lot of us up here at admin really taken a lot of strides these past year, few years to make some pretty 
remarkable changes to the Delaware DOC system. That way we are improving our best outcomes and we're putting folks in place where they need to be. And that's been one of the one of the big pushes since I've started over this in this back in the Bureau of Prisons from working with the probation and parole side and seeing some of the folks that were support order to programs and programs unfortunately falling through because we didn't have the right dosage or the right population serving in those programs. We've made a lot of big strides in how we are classifying folks to programs to get them in the right pro the right treatment. You know, we mentioned that you know we're a unified correctional system, and that also means we're a unified team. It takes a team approach to really make some of these moves happen, to make some of these policy changes and practices really change for the course of the Delaware DOC. You know, we've been very proud and very fortunate to have some really great staff working behind the scenes, working in our streets to make this process seamless. And for the continuity, you know, we done a lot of things to make sure that things are working from one facility to the next and from one level to the next, which is one of the benefits and advantages of working in a unified system. So just some closing food for thoughts. And then I guess we can go ahead to the next slide. All right. Okay, thanks so much, um, Heidi and Joanna for your presentation. Um, we did want to provide you with some email addresses for different teams at DOC who might be able to help with your questions. We have um, the DOC reentry email um, that will come to any questions that you send to that mailbox will come to the director of reentry here in the Office of Planning and uh, Planning Research and Reentry. Uh, victim services. Um, we have a full time uh, victim service advocate who um, works for the Department of Correction to assist victims and the community relations. Um, mailbox is also on here. If you have specific questions about a specific offender or inmate um, that you are looking for answers for, um, community relations would be your contact. They would either put you, um, either help you with a question or put you in touch with someone who could. Um, you know, just know that if when you contact community relations about a specific offender, they may ask you um, if you have a release of information or assist you in obtaining that um, uh, um, about the specific inmate or offender because we don't want to um, release private offender information to someone who doesn't have the authority to receive it. Uh, but these are um, some contacts if um, you need additional assistance. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A section in a moment. Um, Jessica, if you could go to the next slide. Um, but we did want to talk about um, future topics that we're going to cover. Um, so August, our August webinar, the third in our series, will touch on substance use disorder programming in the department, as well as medication-assisted treatment. Um, so stay tuned for that August date. You'll um, get an email, and we hope you can join us for that session. Um, we would like to um, invite you to provide some feedback on today's webinar. Um, so we know um, if you found the content helpful and additionally, if there is, um, you know, what additional content you might be interested in joining us for. So I'm gonna launch two polls kind of back to back. Um, the results of these polls like the rest are also um, anonymous. So please feel free to give your um, honest feedback. Um, so the first question is, um, how would you rate today's webinar? And then the second poll is gonna ask about um, the upcoming series that you might be interested in. Um, as you're voting, um, we're gonna move on. A lot of really good questions have been submitted. So we will move on to Q&A and I will post some of your questions to um, Joanna and Heidi and hopefully we will be able to um, sufficiently answer your questions. Um, more specific questions about individual circumstances we'll, we'll answer offline um, and we might not be able to get to everyone, um, everyone's questions, but we'll attempt to answer afterward if we do not. Um, so I guess the first, uh, one of the first questions posed was about um, programming opportunities for the detention population. Um, so, you know, the things that we went over um, today are um, more for the sentence population. Um, Joanna or Heidi, could you talk about what we do have available for the detention or population in terms of programming? Heidi, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So for our pretrial population, we currently offer the six for one program that is recommended through some of those pretrial assessments. Joe, if you could give a brief description. I don't have the description up with me right now. Yes. Yeah, so six for one um, 
deals a lot with substance abuse disorder, but it also has components of life skills programming. It really, you know, because people aren't classified to it, um, we're not assessing the needs as thoroughly. And so it covers a fairly general curriculum, but it does focus heavily on substance use and participation in the six for one program um, is beneficial for pretrial detentioners because um, the judge would be reviewing that information at the time of sentencing and it indicates um, that the person has started to address some of their treatment needs. Um, so that, like Heidi said, that is available to people pre-trial. Um, we have that available for both men and women. The other thing that we have available for pre-trial detentioners, if they are under age 22 and eligible for special education, we do provide special ed services to that detentioner group. But um, typically detentioners are not going to be there long enough to enroll in education. So unless they're special education eligible, they're not going to be enrolled in education. So, you know, keeping in mind that like 30 to 45 days is the, the typical um, pretrial detention um, length of stay. And so it's, it's barely enough time for us to assess them, let, let alone get them enrolled in a program. So the six for one, you know, is, is really one of our only things that we offer. Um, but it is something we've discussed whether we could make more available for pretrial. And I do want to mention we do have reentry planning support available for pretrial detentioners with opiate use disorder um, and those with special needs. So they would get like a, a special flag and we would make sure that Centurion reentry staff met with them prior to discharge. So it's not not like we don't do anything for detentioners, but um, like Heidi said, the, the majority of the focus for programming and then also um, reentry discharge planning is going to be on that sentence population because we have more time to get to know them and what their needs are and to put a plan together. Thank you. So Heidi, we have a couple of questions, I think, about the flow of classification and the flow of reclassification. So if you could start, um, if you could, um, you know, talk about when, like how soon after um, you arrive in our facility, the classification process starts um, and then touch on the different um, assessments and the different pieces that are used to make the larger classification decision, right? So the, there was a question posed, is, is, is the r, &R included in um, reclassification? Is the security classification piece done again at reclassification? So if you could talk about, um, I guess first talk about the experience um, for the initial classification, like how long that typically takes, and then also talk about what things are included in the classification. All right. So again, starting from initial sentencing and then initial classification, we work on having all the assessments done on the initial classification within 45 days. The initial classification encompasses the security risk, the LSIR, and the r, &R. Once we gather all that data, we make those recommendations and we package that as their initial classification. Now, as we move forward, or Johnny Smith again moves forward and he comes up for his six month review reclassification, that classification will only consist of a security risk assessment. We will continue to work off of his treatment plan based off of the results of the r, &R and the LSIR. What we find is the data that we receive at the intake process is the most beneficial because they are now in a structured environment. Not a lot of things change in reference to their criminal history. Their biggest change factors could be disciplinary, which could impact their where they're housed at within our facilities. So we continue to work off of the initial assessments all the way up until about one year prior to that release. One year prior to that release, we want to reassess them to gauge how much they've done since they've been in our custody and determine if any of those criminogenic factors have changed since they've been in our custody. That last classification, r, &R LSIR, gives us a good picture. And it also gives us the ability to kind of conduct some, do some data to, from the start of the incarceration to the end of the incarceration. We can determine, has their risk factors changed? Has the rate for recidivism changed? And it gives us something to look at as we continue to assess our practices as the DOC and to make sure that we're hitting some of those benchmarks with each of our inmates that are in our custody and ensuring that we're, their, treatment ban their treatment plan is being fulfilled. Does that help? Thank you. Um, so then I think to kind of piggyback on that, the, a question was posed, um, with um, 
in the classification board process, how much influence does uh, does what the inmate um, believes they need to want to be doing or need to be working on during their incarceration? How much does that play into the um, process? So again, with being an objective basis, objective based system, we can take in consideration some of what they want to do. But at the end of the day, we have to figure out what they need to do to truly impact the rehabilitation. I encourage our counselors and our treatment and our treatment staff and classification staff is to work with them so that they understand why the recommendations are being made on their behalf. And through the use of those assessments and collecting that information, sharing how we're going to impact the rehabilitation, most of the time, for ma majority of them, they are willing to go along with the recommendations of the DOC. Of course, you know, we will have some folks that, of course, we're not going to know what, what's best for them, but classification at the end of the day has the final say into what programs that you should be participating in during your incarceration at in our facilities. And then um, Heidi, another question was asked is, is there ever a delay in classification? Delay. Right? So we say that, you know, this is, you know, this is occurring, these assessments are occurring in a certain number of days and classification is also occurring in a certain period of time. Do we ever experience delays in our classification process? Absolutely. We always will. We, absolutely. So there's a lot of different scenarios that come up in side of the prison walls that could delay a classification. Someone's medical, someone's mental health. There's a lot of different things, a lot of different factors that could impact someone's classification. If there's still a lot of pending charges, if there's other things that are involved, we literally have to look at every single case on a case by case basis. And of course, we try to streamline those cases the best that we can, but there will be some delays and interruptions in other folks' cases, depending on the totality of those circumstances. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, there have been a couple of questions I see that have been posed about our um, transgender um, population. Um, and I can actually answer that. So it looks like a couple of people have asked, um, our inmates, how are transgender inmates assigned in our facilities? Um, so the you know questions are asked upon intake if, if about whether or not um, an inmate who's coming in identifies as um, transgender, and additionally, it's um, a person can, you know, it, let us know at any point during our incarceration that they identify as transgender. So how our housing decisions are made with transgender um, inmates is, um, it's kind of, it's a totality of the circumstances. So our policy um, says that the, um, that biological sex assigned at birth is not the determining factor for what facility that you will be assigned to. Um, we have to take into consideration um, gender identity, the uh, preference of the, the inmate who is identified as transgender, um, where um, security wise and um, programming wise, we feel that we can best meet the needs of the transgender offender. And um, we have to consider security concerns for other inmates um, related to if, if this individual would pose any security concerns to other inmates within the facility. So we don't, decisions on housing transgender inmates are not made solely based on the individual's um, sexual assignment at birth, but they're made um, in, com in conjunction with security, medical and mental health as to the best place for that individual to receive the services that they need within our facilities. I hope that answers that question. Um, we have a section um, on the DOC website that discusses um, uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. So the um, kind of monitoring of our um, transgender individuals in our facility falls under the um, Prison Rape Elimination Act coordinator for the department. So there's a section on the DOC website that um, provides information on our annual reports and the PREA standards. We also have a transgender, um, or well, we have a gender identity um, review committee who meets quarterly to discuss issues related to inmates in our custody who identify as transgender, where we review their um, their needs and their requests and make sure that we are, um, you know, aligning with best practices. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, there's another question about how we identify um, veterans in our custody and if we have reentry contacts for them when they're released. Joe, if you want to, if you can take that one. Sure. Um, yes, we do ask about veteran status when um, people enter custody. It is self-report at that time. 
Um, and so we actually keep a record of veteran status and their, their discharge status, like whether it was an honorable or dishonorable discharge. I think there's a couple other categories in there as well. So we actually keep track of that. We are able to sort it by facility. And what we've started doing in the past, um, I think eight months or so is we run that list regularly to see if we have any new people who came into custody who are veterans. Um, and there are ways to verify that veteran status as well. And um, we actually have a partnership with the local um, veterans housing organization. Um, and so what we do is we have our correctional staff um, take information to those people who, who have been identified as veterans and they offer um, you know, a pamphlet about the program. And if the person says they wanna participate then um, that veterans organization makes contact with the individual and offer services. So that is one way we're doing it. In the future, we would love to expand that to probation and parole, um, but right now that's happening um, in our level five facilities statewide. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. A couple of people have asked if you join us late, if the webinar is going to be available after the fact, and we do have a recording that we will make available um, for you after the um, webinar is completed. Um, Heidi, we have a question about, um, are there special considerations and classification for elderly or those with serious illnesses? And is there any method for them to be released early? You're muted. There we go. So I could actually do a whole webinar on the whole early release process. <laughs> but to kind of streamline the question, yes, there is a mechanism in Delaware DOC's ability to early release someone for medical purposes only. It's called a medical truth and sentencing modification. That does come, I talked about the four different boards, the IRCB oversees all and any modifications to sentencing, parole, or medical, um, medical or compassionate releases, as they, as they like to call it as well. In terms of their security housing, uh, if their medical needs are significant, they are housed in our infirmary regardless of their classification, but they have cells back there for based upon the, the, the security risk of the individuals that are in our medical units. But Delaware D said we have to give them a certain level of care and we do so. Thank you. There's a question um, about good time. And we do have, we are gonna do a webinar on sentence calculation and release dates in December, I think, where we'll touch more on good time. Um, I think that the, I'm sorry, there's lots of questions coming in. So let me see if I can find the very specific. So it, it's just a general question about good time credits for completing programs. I don't know if anybody is comfortable off the top of their head talking about amounts of good time or if we just want to kind of refer that back to join us in December. We can give it a shot. It just depends on how, how intricate. So the question is really, it's just broad, good time credits for completing um, programs. Correct. There, we do offer good time, bonus good time. Let me clarify. Bonus good time for successfully completing an evidence-based program within DOC. So yeah. good time is, is pretty complicated. There's statutory good time and then there, there are there's um, like different behavior -based good, good time. time. So my suggestion for if you would like more information on good time is to kind of join us in December when we talk about sentence calculation and releases. That'll be um, that'll be where you get the most information. And it's kind of ever changing. There's there's currently legislation out there to kind of to, to start awarding good time for, um, for, for, for work and increasing the amount of good time days. So it's always, it's kind of, it's an ever-changing and complicated um, process that we are gonna discuss um, in December. Yeah, and there's, there's a DOC policy that lays out what is eligible for good time. So, you know, institutional jobs that the inmates may work are eligible for good time. Um, Heidi mentioned programs. So if you go to programs, you would you could get good time for that potentially. And then if you complete certain programs, they have been approved for bonus good time. So not only for going, but for completing, you get bonus good time. Um, and then of course, for institutional infractions, the good time can be taken away as a disincentive, right? And then there are other ways that people can earn good time. Like for example, um, getting vaccinated against COVID-19, um, that's now been added, right? So inmates who choose to get back, complete that vaccination um, and, and complete their vaccination program um, 
are now eligible to get good time for that. So, uh, you know, like Heather and Heidi have said, it's it's very in depth. We can't cover it here, but um, I expect at the um, sentence calculation um, webinar, they'll they'll get into a little bit more detail. There's some threshold. You have to do a certain amount of good time, um, certain amount of programming hours to trigger good time in a given month. So, just way too many details to get into here. Thank you. All right, Heidi, there was a question. Um, the participant said that you mentioned that a risk assessment score can be adjusted using discretion um, by the staff to allow more access to activities. Can discretion also be used to increase a risk score? Yes, discretion can be used to increase or decrease based upon some, there's variable, variable factors within our risk assessment to increase or decrease. For example, um, uh, So for increasing, say the, in, the individual may have been brought up with institutional charges and pending pretrial and they're scoring minimum. But based upon the totality of the case, the, the, the case manager can recommend medium due to the pending matters that are against that individual. That would be a, a quick scenario. But there are various scenarios that can play to increase and decrease someone's security level. But again, it has to be approved too. So it has to go through the boards and multiple eyes have to be on it to make that approval. Right. So that's, I think that's super important is that the, you know, an individual staff member doesn't um, no. just override up or down without no. multiple levels of approval by other people um, um, checking in. Um, and, you know, we do have a couple things in the chat that have been mentioned um, that I just want to point out, too, is that we have um, the all, uh, nearly all of the Department of Correction policies are available on our website. If you just Google Delaware Department of Correction um, and you can view um, policies related to the application of good time, DOC 7.2, mm -hmm. and then um, program eligibility for good time 3.18. Um, we'll discuss good time in more detail and, 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 and all of the DOC policies are um, out, on the, out on the website. We have very few that are not available to you publicly. So please check that, that out for more information. There's a question about, so when you're reevaluating, so the question is when reevaluating using the LSIR, how do you determine a change um, for the same question that was asked on the first LSIR. So basically, I think the question is when an LSIR, I guess the question is why do an LSIR, redo LSIRs, right? If we've, we've asked these questions um, the first time, how do we determine, how do we determine when there's a need to redo the LSIR for a change in circumstance? A really good question because you know I think what the the asker is getting at is you're incarcerated so you don't have the opportunities to really address your housing and your employment in the same way that you would if you were in the community so it's hard to make those gains that would bump you down in risk so I understand the question um, I think the answer to that would be um, there are opportunities to bump your risk level down while you're incarcerated there absolutely are right so some of those pro-social behaviors you could demonstrate while you're incarcerated. Um, you know, there are ways that you can chip away at, at some of those domains. Um, I will also say the LSIR is one of several factors that influences what programs you get funneled to. So um, Heidi covered how completing more programs actually bump, could bump you down. It's one of the ingredients that could bump you down on the housing security level, right? So it could take you down from maximum to medium or medium to minimum. So keeping in mind the LSIR is an important tool, but it's not the only tool. And so we're not going to keep somebody out of programs or something forever because, you know, they remain at high risk or moderate risk. Um, so they, their eligibility to participate in programming is going to expand the lower their housing security level, right? So at, at medium and, and um, minimum, they're going to have more programs available to them. Also, I did want to mention, if some of you caught it because you typed it in the chat, I, inver in my notes, inverted the percentages when I was looking at the level five um, risk level. So it is actually 40% uh, high risk and 51 moderate risk. So for those who answered in the, the opinion poll, what do you think is the highest risk level? It is moderate risk. So my apologies for the confusion. You all were right. 
Thank you. All right, so I think I think that is I think that we've kind of touched on all of the questions that we can kind of answer publicly. Some people have submitted questions that um, you know are, are related to kind of more specific individual circumstances that we would you know need to talk about offline. Um, and some additional questions that we've you know indicated that are going to be discussed during um, upcoming um, webinars. So um, we do just want to thank everybody for attending. We hope that you were um, able to you know have your questions answered and learned a little bit more about um, the Department of Correction and how we um, how we you know what inmates experience as far as um, coming into our facilities and the classification process. Um, Again, we have upcoming webinars. I, I said earlier, the August webinar is gonna be substance use disorder programming and medically assisted treatment. Um, and then we have probation and parole coming up, sentence calculation and release dates. You know, I think there's gonna be quite a few topics that are coming up that are interest, will be hopefully be interested, interesting to everyone. And we really appreciate everyone's, um, you know, kind of interest and participation in, in the things that we're doing here at the DOC. And thank you again for, um, to Director Collier and Chief Champney for um, presenting all this information. And I think that that will wrap us up. Thanks everyone, it was good, good discussion, good topics, good questions. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone, see you next time. Yeah.